I want to talk about a lot about uh, creativity. It's an area that I've studied as a computer scientist in terms of tools for creativity over the years. And in fact, I think it's an important topic. You might think, here's a computer scientist coming to talk to folks in the schools, and he'll probably be pushing computer technology on us. Um, in fact, I probably will. But I also will have a bit of a cautionary note about it, because a lot of my research has been about how computer technology can in some ways get in the way of creativity in the domains that I study and how to design it more appropriately to encourage creativity. And so creativity, we might think about, is an area that's very important. In fact, there's those out there who have made an entire career about talking about how a creative class can make your whole city more successful economically as well as socially and, and a better place to live. And a lot of those folks that we think of in the creative class often are people like engineers and designers and artists. And in fact, I've studied a lot in what I call computer user interface design. So the people who are designing the new computer technologies that you often interact with, or your new phones and other kind of gadgets. And one of the really important steps in that creative process, in the early stages of design, is sketching. So when you see designers, you'll see they sketch many, many, many versions of things, really trying to find the ideas. And and the whole idea of trying hundreds of different ideas is to come up with the right one. And so sketching is really important for this process because it really encourages what we call lateral thinking. So you see different ideas. So the ambiguity in the sketch is actually inherently important because it helps you see new ideas. And that's been one of the problems with computer-based tools. They tend to try to get rid of the ambiguity and make things very specific and exact. And so a lot of studies of designers using computer-based tools have found that they take one idea and they go really deep instead of exploring a design space in the early stages of design. So really experienced designers in the early stages of design will try many different ideas. And so I've worked a lot in studying design and how to make computer tools kind of fit better with this methodology. Now, what does this have to do with education? Well, one project that we started a few years ago um, with a former graduate student of mine, Richard Davis, who's now on the faculty at Singapore Management University, was we were looking at how to express dynamic ideas. So originally, I came into my office in Berkeley at that time and said, I saw this accident today. And I sketched it on my whiteboard. And I was trying to show how I was walking across the street. And this one car was turning. And this other car was coming this way. And they almost hit me. And they hit each other. And it was kind of hard to explain it. And I really wanted to just say, make that sketch go, you know, animate it. And I wanted to be able to do it that fast. And I felt, boy, that would be great in teaching if I could just sketch something on the whiteboard and say, go, and have it explain some concept. Or even before a class, if I could sketch something so quickly that it would be easy to throw into my slides. Okay? So here was an example that Richard actually did field work, talking to teachers, talking to animators, talking to kids. He actually collected animations from kids who were taking an animation class in, at kind of an elementary school level. And this is one of the examples that came from a real teacher who said, you know, I'm trying to explain how a battery works. And this is what you'll see in the textbook, this kind of diagram. And it's showing, you know, when the switch opens, these electrons go down one of the cathodes. And then you'll see um, these sulfate ions go across this membrane and, and go to the, the anode. And, and it goes. And, and he said, it's kind of hard to get people the idea of this. I'd like to animate it. So, you know, Richard became an expert in Flash, which is an animation tool. And you know this took about an hour for an expert to do. And if it's going to take an hour, no one's going to do that in real time in a lecture or even before a lecture. Maybe you'll do one or two of those in a semester, I would say, as a professor. That's how much time I'm going to give to that. Um, so we want to say, hey, could you sketch something like that in a minute? And could you make something like this, You know, essentially showing what happens? As you know, the switch is open, the electrons move, you get a voltage when it closes and see how the sulfate ions move, people could really understand what was going on. So that led to this project that Richard did as part of his PhD called K-Sketch. And the basic idea was just let you sketch something and try to show how it animates and let you get at the basic idea. And don't focus on colors and fonts and making things perfect. Get the idea out there really quickly. So the idea is you just sketch it. So let's say we wanted to show in a science class that we have you know, a positron and a, and a and an electron or something come together. So we just draw, draw the positron, and um, we're just going to select it with a pen. And this little tool comes up, and we just drag it across and say, OK, that's where we want it. 
And then we just move time back up here by just dragging this time slider and say, okay, now we're back where we started in time. And then the next step here is we draw the electron and we grab it. And once we start moving it, time starts going again. And we just kind of time it by ourselves, trying to make them hit. We don't like set, okay, this goes for 1.5 seconds. It's just by hand and rough. We make those two things come together. And then if we were to play this again, essentially they'd come together and then we could draw an explosion or whatever. But the idea is it's that fast to do something simple like this. And you can imagine how you can do more complicated things. So let's say we have a student he's trying to show you this asteroid in and hit the Yucatan and took out all the dinosaurs. You know, he draws this asteroid and he sh draws it and just says, okay, it's gonna move like this. And he goes back in time and said, but I really want it to rotate. So we can actually compose these different motions together. And that's actually when things start to get really complicated in tools that are out there. He just brings it back in time and then he adds this other motion to it, essentially this rotation motion. And so you can scale things and change their sizes and do all the things you might imagine. And that's kind of what the project was. This is the first thing somebody did with it. The first time they ever used the tool, they were able to kind of like do this, okay? This is of things that you can do in the tool. This was somebody who was a research subject who was in a one hour study doing something else with the tool and they just kind of sketched this out afterwards. And you know, I'm from Seattle and so this kind of tells you what it's like there. So I'm really actually enjoying this weather here in uh, Beijing. Cold is great because the sun is out and I'm not used to that. Um, let's see, I have another couple um, that I wanted to just show you because they're more education oriented, but those were the ones I had there. So these are ones that were part of Richard's dissertation. Some folks in England have downloaded the uh, tool because it's open source, ksketch.org, and in high school science classes, they were using it on little tablet PCs, and this is one student trying to show how catalytic cracking happens as the temperature gets up to some point, and we see um, this molecule is gonna break in some way, okay? and. Again, the students were using it to, to you know, illustrate their understanding of scientific concept. That's one example that's kind of serious, just kind of fun, or to see what the kids did. This was you know, somebody trying to show uh, the formation of crude oil. So this is kind of the end of the animation here, um, but it starts over. I have it just kind of looping here on the web. We'll see, okay, so we have some animals you know, out in the sea or fish, and you know, they're swimming around, and eventually die, <laughs> kind of pile up on the bottom, you know, and then over time we get our, you know, oil derrick out there drilling oil, okay? Um, and then, just fun, laboratory rules, you know, why do you have to have your hair, you know, up, you know, to be safe was, you know, somebody was walking around in the lab and you kind of saw the, the punchline there at the beginning, but she's walking around and didn't have her hair up and oh, bad things happened. So, um, you know, those are what the kids did. Um, so, you know, again, the whole design of that tool was to say pay attention, let people be creative, don't get in the way by um, kind of adding, adding kind of the, the details that computer technology often um, encourages us to do. They don't necessarily force, force the people to do it, but it, if it's there, you'll mess with it. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about was sensing. This is just more of a, of a call for the future here in some ways, which is, let's see if I can click on this maybe. Um, what's going on really right now, just to give you kind of what's the future. Essentially right now, many of the people right here have a phone like this, whether it's an iPhone or a Google Android phone or whatever, a smartphone or what the Wall Street Journal is now calling an app phone or the New York Times. This is no longer a phone. <laughs> This is a really powerful computing, communications, and sensing platform that everyone is gonna have in their pocket or purse. And if they don't have it today, whatever that phone they have now in three years will be as powerful as this. And it's really changing the way we're gonna think of computing. And usually what happens with these exponential changes is you don't see it until after it's happened, like five years later. But this really is changing what's going on. It's in everyone's lives, they have it all the time. We can tell, right now I have software running in my labs, we can tell whether you're taking a train or you're riding your bike or you're walking, and we have an application that tries to encourage people to be more green in their transit activities. We can tell if you're exercising, if you're running, biking, on a Stairmaster, on a treadmill, and try to encourage um, more exercise for those who are working on that. We're also working on, if you're in a foreign country, how, how to 
understand the context of what you're doing to help you learn the language. So if I'm here in Beijing and I'm on the metro, hey, it starts to teach me about words about travel and tickets. And if I'm at a restaurant, it teaches me about food. And if I take a picture of a fire hydrant, it might be able to use either computer vision to tell me what that word is in Chinese or find a Chinese speaker who's trying to learn English and have them label the picture and we kind of help each other out. This is what's going on now, and I think in terms of education, sometimes we might say, oh, we don't want those phones in the schools, or what are the kids going to do bad? In some ways, I think you need to start thinking, what is the creative things that kids might be able to do with this really powerful thing that they're all carrying around? And it's going to have all of these capabilities. We already have done it. We've shown it. But, so you'll be seeing it. So things like social media and these other things, Facebook, you might um, well, you have a hard time getting them to work in China, um, but you might be sometimes scared that that's a problem, but instead think of what is the opportunity and how can kids use their creativity to make these things valuable. And that's all I have to say. Thank you.